Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. My guest today is Dr. Alan Goldhammer. Dr. Goldhammer is the founder of True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California. He is the co-author of this book, The Pleasure Trap, and he is a pioneer in the plant-based nutrition space. This conversation is about many things, but there is a particular focus on fasting today, and it is fascinating. I think you're gonna enjoy it. If you enjoy my content in general, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button. And without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Alan Goldhammer. All right, let's do it. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming out here to do this. It's my pleasure. It's been a long time in the coming. Um, we're gonna talk about fasting. We're gonna talk about a whole food plant-based diet, particularly your specific bent on it, the SOS version of a whole food plant-based diet. But before we do that, I think what would be really interesting and, and, and something about your work specifically that I find fascinating and that I appreciate is that it's very much rooted in as much in psychology as it is in nutrition science and, and, and physiology. And beneath all of that, again, which I appreciate, is the fact that um, there are some uncomfortable truths about, <laughs> about our relationship to food that is premised in this vernacular around addiction. And as somebody who is long time in recovery, this is the lens that I kind of approach all of these things. And it's something that I think is under addressed in this conversation about not just a healthy diet, but how we transition to a healthy diet because people, um, you know, we're, we're emotional beings and it's less about the information than it is about trying to help people figure out how to traverse that tricky, you know, sort of tightrope between old habits and new habits. And by, by kind of couching all of this in those uncomfortable truths about our addictive relationship with food, I think is, is really powerful. Well, the reality is, you know, humans evolved in on a very different environment than one that we, the one we live in today. Mm -hmm. We lived in an environment of scarcity. So most humans actually didn't live to reproduce. They didn't pass on their genes. They died from predation. They died from starvation. Uh, a few survived, our ancestors. Uh -huh. our, our ancestors were the winners. Yeah. They got enough to eat. They didn't get eaten. They lived long enough to reproduce. Mm -hmm. And our bodies and our minds were perfectly designed for that environment of scarcity. So now human beings being the innovative creatures we are, we change everything. We change the environment we live in dramatically. And now we don't live in that environment of scarcity. At least most of us don't. We live in an environment of abundance. And although we're perfectly designed for that environment of scarcity, this environment of abundance can trip us up and it does. Mm -hmm. And it's responsible for the systematic overeating that people do that leads to the obesity, that leads to the metabolic syndrome, that leads to the vulnerability to infectious disease and the chronic degenerative diseases, the cardiovascular disease, and many of the cancers. And so that, that reality is why it's so difficult for people to adjust to the idea that they just can't eat as much of whatever they want and yeah. get away with it. Yeah. It's almost as if, you know, if you're a if you're a heroin addict or an alcoholic, everywhere you go, everybody is a heroin addict or an alcoholic. There is no safe space, right? We've normalized our behavior and our respective relationships with food to such an extent that the radical notion is to step outside of that and do something different. Two thirds of people in industrialized societies are overweight or obese. If you're not fat, you're abnormal. Right. And if you go to a physician and you say you're significantly overweight and you've lost a bunch of weight, the physician doesn't immediately think, oh, you must have adopted a whole plant food diet and become an exercise program. Their differential diagnosis is, uh-oh, this could be colon cancer Mm. eating disorder or they drug addiction. They pathologize a healthy choice. Well, the only experience they have of people losing weight and keeping it off is when they've got cancer, they've developed an eating disorder or they're mm. a drug addict. Mm -hmm. And so it's not even in their uh, expectation that people are gonna actually get well. You go to a physician with most of the diseases of dietary excess, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, and they're gonna tell you, look, you're gonna be on drugs the rest of your life. If you do what I tell you, I promise you, you'll never get well. You'll be sick forever. 
because it's not in their expectation that people are gonna actually recover their health yeah. because they're not addressing the actual reasons why they're developing the problem to begin with. They're not addressing the causes of the problem. I think in tandem with that, there's also this pessimism from the typical general practitioner that any advice or, or kind of advised protocols about healthy lifestyle change fall on deaf ears. It's like, yeah, I could tell this person they should go to the gym or they should eat better and and you know, maybe I'm going to maybe I'll say that, but there isn't a real expectation that that's going to move the needle or that that person is going to be able to adhere to any kind of prescribed lifestyle change. And and that's because we're dealing with people that are addicts. Yes. And so you talk about that. Expound upon expand expound upon that idea because I think it's really important. You you don't just say to an alcoholic, "Oh, you know how your life sucks? Yeah. It's because you're a drunk. <laughs> uh, stop drinking. Yeah. And the alcoholic would say- I've been told that. Oh, it's the alcohol? I had no idea. Thank mm. you so much. I won't drink again. Right. It doesn't quite work that way. We don't currently lie to alcoholics the same way we do lie to people, for example, that are overweight. We tell alcoholics, look, you have a particular vulnerability. You can't drink. You need to come up with a strategy each and every day that allows you to not drink. And if you can figure out how to do that, you win. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, you're gonna be in trouble. So the same thing is actually true in many degrees to people that are overweight. But what we tell the overweight person is, oh, just put your food on a smaller plate. Here, cut your food with a knife and and Mm -hmm. put your fork down between each bite and you won't be overweight anymore. You just need to learn to eat moderately. And yeah. just eat a little bit less. It's it's the analog in addiction is you know quit the quit the whiskey and just drink beer or put your beer in a smaller or, or only binge on the weekends and maybe don't get behind the wheel of a car. Right. And it, and it's not real. We know with alcohol the answer is don't drink. The, and the truth is, for people that are suffering with obesity, for people that are suffering with these diseases of dietary excess, it would be better to avoid the chemicals that are fooling your brain into allowing you to systematically overconsume than it would be to pretend that you can just have a little bit. If you could have just had a little bit, you would have just had a little bit and you would have had the thing under control. You can't, you don't. If you're an alcoholic, you're not the person that can have an occasional drink. Okay, Mm -hmm. And if you're the person that's suffering with these diseases, you may find it's easier to just adopt a strategy that eliminates these chemicals that fool the brain. We talk about this pleasure trap, the artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain that results from chemicals that we put in our food that fool our brain. The chemicals we put in our food are things like salt, oil, and sugar. These are highly fractionated food byproducts, not food, and they stimulate the dopamine cascade in the brain. They make food taste better. They make food more interesting to us. And as a consequence, we will systematically overeat. Now, just like some people can occasionally have a drink and not become a drunk, some people can have bits of this without it becoming a a health compromising uh, problem. But if you're the overweight person, if you're the person with the heart disease, the cancer, the diabetes, it's not you. You're the person that would be better off saying, let me avoid those chemicals. I'll stop fooling my brain. I'll eliminate the systematic overeating. I'll reverse the disease and pathology. And I'll adapt a strategy that doesn't include continually beating myself up with these Mm. things that I'm not capable of regulating. People have an easy time understanding that alcohol is a powerful drug, that heroin is something that is going to kill you. The addictive nature of these substances is is well understood. But when it comes to food, that's a leap of faith for a lot of people. It's, it's, It's a bridge too far to say, I understand alcoholism and drug addiction, but when you start talking about food as addictive, you're starting to lose me. Yeah, well, the reality is that the, the neural cascade that's associated with addiction of any kind is very similar. Now, I'm not arguing that alcohol or cocaine or heroin might be even more potent than say the sugar or the oil or the salt or the combination, but the net effect of salt, oil and sugar in the diet is actually obvious and devastating around Mm -hmm. us. It's why you see obesity and the disease of dietary excess. That's Mm -hmm. what's making people fat. It is the hidden force that undermines health and happiness. It is a pleasure trap. And because people don't recognize it, it's very difficult for them to take action uh, to eliminate it. At least with alcohol, most people know, oh, if you're an alcoholic, you probably shouldn't drink. If you go to a party and they say, oh, you're gonna have some alcohol. And you say, well, I I, I can't because I have an alcohol problem. Most people at least will be tolerant of you. 
because right. okay, you got an issue, you don't have to. But if if you go in and you say, oh no, I I don't want to eat, you're gonna really upset people. Oh, yeah. what's wrong with this? My you doctor can have says just this. Great. A little bit won't hurt. What's right. wrong? You know? Yeah. So it's complicated. It's complicated in terms of the internal psychology in trying to reframe our relationship with food, but there's also all of these social constructs that create even additional complexity that make it very difficult to modify behavior. There's no question. In fact, the, the social roadblocks to health are probably some of the limiting factors. Yeah. I think that's probably true in all addiction though. You know, one of the challenges for people with alcohol is oftentimes the social consequences yes. uh, of not participating. And this is definitely true with food. We've built so much of our social interaction around food that even, even if you're looking to just modify the type of food you eat, it can be very upsetting for mm -hmm. people and they can get really defensive about it. Right, so let's talk a little bit more about the pleasure trap specifically, what that is. You co-authored this book, seminal work with, with Doug Lyle. I've seen his TED talk. I've seen him give his presentation many times on this subject. And that really you know, elucidates this dysfunctional relationship with food and, and why it is from an evolutionary and, and psychological perspective. Well, you know, there's this idea of dopamine is a neurochemical associated with pleasure. And there's two behaviors critical for human beings' survival. And that is food and sex. Mm. You have to get enough to eat in order to be able to sustain yourself. And you have to engage in enough sexual behavior so that you can pass on your genes and the whole process can start over again. So it's not surprising that food and sex are heavily reinforced. And the way the, body, the brain reinforces the body's behavior is by rewarding us with dopamine, mm -hmm. which is the neurochemical associated with pleasure. So the more dopamine, the more pleasure. The more dopamine, the better the food tastes. And so you react to food in response to largely caloric density. The higher the caloric density, the more valuable it is in this environment of scarcity in which we evolved. And so the higher caloric density foods are, tend to be more reinforced, more dopamine, better tasting. So what we've done as humans, we're innovative creatures. We said, oh, if a little good, a lot's better. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out a way to make the food taste even more special by increasing its caloric density. And we do that by adding things like oil and sugar to the food. And as a consequence, we like it better. And if that's what you get used to eating, that's all you like. And eventually people get to the point they really don't like the taste of simple whole natural yeah. foods anymore because this hyper drug-like stimulating effect of the more concentrated foods is more appealing. So we literally become addicted. For example, if you wanna neuroadapt to a lower salt or lower fat diet, it actually takes time in order for the body right. to go through that adaptation. Right. We right. can speed it up with fasting, but the bottom line is there's a period of adaptation where food doesn't taste good. If you eat whole foods and you're used to eating highly processed foods, it's not that appealing. Now, over time you adapt, and then the body gets to the point where you like mm. the simpler foods again. Yeah, pe people have a hard time believing that you adapt. There's this baked in assumption that you're, 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 you're just gonna, you're, look, you're staring down the pipeline of a lifetime of drab foods that are unappealing and you're just gonna have to tolerate it. Uh, we know there's a literature on this though with, for example, sodium, uh, people use on high sodium diet, it takes about a month on a low sodium diet for the average person to neuroadapt to a lower salt diet. You know, with fat, it takes almost three months. Wow. It takes three months on a lower fat diet before that satiety mechanism that's used to being kicked in by the higher caloric density fat begins to adapt and you will feel satisfied on a lower, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, density foods. So the, the fruits, the vegetables, the grains, the goons, you will now feel satisfied. Whereas initially you don't because you're used to being satiated with these high fat, uh, this high fat intake. And that, t that can take months. And yeah. so it's a problem if you say to a person, well, look, you're gonna eat this new diet. You're gonna feel like crap and you're not gonna like it. And, but it'll only be a few months. Right. Eh, adherence may, may be lagging. Whereas if you can make that process happen more quickly, the ability to get people to make dietary changes speeds up. And that's what we found with fasting. And sometimes that's a way of getting people to the point where good food tastes good more quickly. Yeah. There does seem to be something about preparing people for that stage of acclimation. And there also seems to be something magical about the 90 day window in, in you know, with drugs and alcohol, that's sort of the typical window that people say it takes, you know, it takes about that much time to kind of wean yourself off these cravings and, reset your system. A lot of people just wanna, they wanna, they're not willing to weather that period of discomfort. And perhaps there's a lack of belief that they'll reset and be able to reframe so that 
you know, what they once create, like to get over the craving, you have to deprive yourself and then you reboot. And then those things that have held you hostage for so long suddenly hold less and less power over time. And the fact that it can happen more quickly uh, with fasting is really an interesting thing. For example, smokers, you know, it's not easy to quit smoking once you're addicted to nicotine. But most smokers by somewhere between day two and day four of fasting no longer report withdrawal That's effects from, from cigarettes. Now, some people say, yeah, they're so miserable fasting, they don't even think about them, you know, cigarettes. But the reality is that that whole uh, adaptive process just is sped up dramatically. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have psychological and social challenges afterwards that you still have to address in order to sustain good behavior patterns. Um, but just getting rid of that first phase of a physical withdrawal and just feeling so crappy and feeling like, you know, uh, you're wondering why you're putting the effort out, getting that behind you quickly really does enhance a person's ability to make the transition yeah, yeah, to being yeah. drug free. I, I understand the you know, when you were talking about caloric density, fat and sugar, these are things that are evolutionarily, you know, we're, we're wired to seek out and to maximize. The salt thing though, that's different. Like why is it, why is it that salt is such a trigger for people? Yeah, this one is probably the most controversial recommendation that we make. Um, people have come around, as you said, with oil, they realize a highly fractionated uh, food product like oil, high caloric density, little satiety feedback, you know, they can understand that sugar, pretty well accepted that refined carbohydrates, they cause your blood uh, uh, insulin levels to rise and then it drives your sugars lower and it fools mm. the brain and now you got cravings. And that's what a lot of the binging and craving and stuff comes around is because of physiological alterations of refined carbohydrates. Uh, but salt also is a really important uh, part of this. And let's talk about a few reasons why that might be. Number one, um, salt is an essential nutrient. That is sodium, mm. is an essential nutrient without which you die. Fortunately, you get all of the sodium you need in a whole natural food diet, just like you get all the sugar you need and all the oil you need. You don't have to add a fractionated concentrated food to get the amount of sodium, the milligrams of sodium that's needed to sustain optimum health. Um, salt also has a, um, a powerful effect on passive overeating. And you can do an experiment yourself. If you just sit down and figure out how much brown rice you'd eat, until you feel satisfied, until you don't want any more. And on a different day, everything else being equal, salt it up and see you'll eat significantly more before mm. you feel satisfied. Now, some people say, yeah, it tastes better. Well, what do you think tasting better means? It means it's stimulating more dopamine in the brain as a result of this artificial type response. And you will systematically eat more on heavily salted foods when you're adapted to that than you will wow. whole natural foods. The other thing is salt has a preservative effect, doesn't it? When they salt foods, it's to keep bugs from mm -hmm. being able to affect it. Well, you have five pounds of bacteria living in your intestinal tract right now, a trillion creatures, a thousand strains. Very important to your immune system to protect you from uh, infectious disease and other problems. And these thousand creatures are living, eating and pooing inside you right now. So if you have five pounds of organisms pooing inside you, you might be concerned about what they're pooing in you because they might be pooing some nasty toxic waste, chemicals like TMA, which becomes TMAO and irritates mm -hmm. the vessels and creates a problem if you're eating animal foods. If that's what right. you're feeding your bacteria, you're feeding your bacteria soluble fibers, you're getting fertilizer, you're getting vitamin K, you're getting a lot of other good stuff. So if you want them, your bacteria pooing fertilizer into you, you want to make sure you're feeding them healthy diet. If, if, if salt is a powerful preservative, let's just imagine what happens when we put a high sodium diet into this bacterial rich environment. It can alter yeah. the gut microbiome. And so sugar can affect it, oil can affect it, and so can salt. So it's been our experience that um, salt in the diet is an important part of obesity for many people, that it's an important part for causing fluid retention, which increases blood volume, which is associated with not just high blood pressure, but also the joint pain, uh, the congestion, a lot of the aches and pains that people have oftentimes is because of this fluid that the body retains to protect itself from the consequences of salt. Mm -hmm. So it has many downstream effects, even though it doesn't have any calories per se, it can still be an important part of uh, the dietary excess profile. And by eliminating the sodium from the diet, you also eliminate a lot of the highly fractionated foods that you just can't eat without salt. Yeah. Even products like bread and cookies and crackers and a lot of this stuff without the salt really doesn't taste that good because they've refined out most of the natural uh, flavors of the food. And what they do is they take these federally subsidized grains like wheat and soy and, then they, and corn and they add oil, salt, and sugar to it 
process it into various looking foods yeah. and call that the diet. Go into a grocery store and walk around and you'll see a lot of those foods are really nothing more than one grain or the other with various concentrations of sugar, oil, and salt. Right, which, which basically allows you to make anything taste good. And you strip away those things and there's something completely unpalatable right. <laughs> and, and nutrition, nutritionally deficient underneath it. And so what we're encouraging people to do is a really radical departure from what they're currently doing, but that's to adopt a whole plant food diet that's free of this added chemicals, free of the salt, oil, and sugar. And what you're left with is things like fruits and vegetables, raw or cooked. Um, minimally processed grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. But you don't have the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, oil, salt, sugar, and highly processed fractionated foods that make up the majority of the people's diet in industrialized society. And it's that diet that makes them fat and sick and develop the diseases of dietary excess. And that what makes you vulnerable to con uh, infectious disease. You know, when you look at what are the vulnerabilities about why do some people get uh, an influenza or a COVID or uh, an infectious disease and, you know, they recover they survive, they have minimal consequence. Other people, it's devastating or deadly. Well, if you look at the risk factors associated with what makes people vulnerable to these diseases, as well as the disease, the chronic diseases, the heart disease, the cancer, the stroke, it's the same metabolic syndrome and all of its associations. Yeah. It's the same obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure and all the consequences of dietary excess. These are reversible and preventable conditions. People don't have to have these conditions. And even if they have them, they can largely reverse them by taking responsibility to control what they put in their mouth. So this is the, the underlying premise uh, that, that drives uh, True North, which you founded, what, like 30 years ago at this point, 35? In 1984. Wow. Was when my wife, Dr. <laughs> Moreno and I started <laughs> True North Health. I can't imagine what it must have been like to basically open the doors to this medically supervised water fasting clinic back in that time. I mean, now it's all the rage. We have Walter Longo and all kinds of scientists studying the phenomenon of fasting deeply. It's part of the public awareness. Everybody's, it's very cool to be out there, you know, sort of experimenting with intermittent fasting. This was not the case back then. Like I, I, I mean, potentially criminal, right? Well, at one point, the California Board of Medical Quality Assurance had rendered an opinion that recommending fasting to a patient constituted such a gross violation of the standard of medical practice that it rose to the level of criminal negligence. Mm. I was actually the first person in my family that required the services of a criminal defense attorney. My father was so wow. proud. Wow, what happened there? Um, they ultimately decided that recommending fasting was not criminal negligence, that in fact, there was even a provision at that time in Medicare to pay for fasting, but as long as it was for rapid weight loss necessary for urgent surgery. If you got well, unfortunately, it wasn't a covered benefit. Um, there was also uh, every hospital today in this country will use versions of fasting uh, for treating conditions like acute pancreatitis. Mm. And we were able to demonstrate that this was not criminally negligent behavior, but was actually a rather innovative look at yeah. uh, trying to help sick people get well. We've gone from being criminal quacks to cutting edge researchers. As you said, there's been some wonderful people like Walter Longo and Matson and, and Fontana and others that have published in major impact journals, uh, this idea that fasting or some modification of an, uh, intermittent fasting or, or modified fasting could be a helpful tool. In fact, it was interesting, Lanco did some research uh, that I think really was uh, pivotal. He looked at uh, cancer treatment uh, and he took you know 30 rats with cancer and gave them enough chemotherapy to resolve all the cancer cells. You have to kind of kill all the cancer cells or they grow back. Mm -hmm. The problem is all the rats died. So that wasn't a really good outcome, but he took the same rats with the same cancer and the same chemotherapy, but he used fasting before, during, and after the treatment. And not only did all 30 rats survive, but dramatically enhanced cancer-free survival. Mm. And so what he found was that there was these things like differential stress sensitization and differential stress resistance, that cancer cells were more vulnerable to the effects of chemotherapy in the fasting states, probably because of their higher metabolic rate. They, they don't adapt to the environment uh, without glucose as well. There's lots of differences in cancer cells to healthy cells. And in the fasting states, the cancer cells were put at a selective disadvantage. Mm. And not only that, healthy cells appeared to be protected during the fasting That's state super interesting. from the effects of chemotherapy. And at that point, people went, uh, particularly uh, pharmaceutically oriented people went, oh, so fasting could make the drugs work better. 
oh, well, maybe it's not quackery all after all. And so there was a lot better tolerance and acceptance of this idea that perhaps fasting may have a role in enhancing conventional treatment. And it was interesting to note too that many of the biomarkers that predict cancer and disease turn off whether you use chemotherapy or not. Wow. So the act of fasting itself puts the body in a selective environment that may be more conducive to healing. And so this type of research, of course, now is taking off and there's been a lot more uh, interest and including by the work that we're doing at the True North Health Center. Yeah, you have this, uh, this study and this experience working with a patient who had stage three follicular lymphoma, right? Where you had like this tremendous result. Um, yeah, we had a young woman with uh, stage three follicular uh, lymphoma that had been uh, well documented, excisional biopsy, the whole bit, and had progressed over a period of a couple years. And uh, she had asked her um, family physician along the way, was there anything she could do conservatively in terms of diet and lifestyle? And he had assured her that diet had nothing to do with follicular lymphoma, that she could eat whatever she wanted to eat. And, and when she inquired about fasting, he informed her that fasting was criminal quackery. Nonetheless, she decided that uh, she didn't want to undergo conventional chemotherapy because with this particular condition, it's not really effective. It doesn't affect all cause mortality. There's a lot of side effects. And so often it's not unusual for them to defer treatment until the condition is quite progressed. In this case, it had progressed enough that he referred her to the medical school, talked to an oncologist. Oncologist also reinforced the idea that diet was irrelevant to this condition, uh, that fasting was unproven. Uh, and even with that advice, she decided to come to a True North Health Center, underwent 21 days of water only fasting, mm -hmm. during which time her tumors that were previously externally palpated, uh, palpable disappeared. Wow. So we fasted her for three weeks, fed her for 10 days, sent her back to uh, the oncologist and he uh, examined her, couldn't find any evidence of the lesions, um, expressed some surprise. Uh, she explained, uh, he said, you know, what did you do? And she said, well, I went to the criminal quacks and I did the fasting <laughs> and the tumors went away. Yeah. And he said, well, that's very impressive. I suggested he'd give me a call and talk to me about it. Um, she asked to have uh, the follow-up CT scan that we requested. And we had warned her that they might be a little reluctant since she didn't have any obvious evidence of symptoms. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, she didn't really need a CT scan, but she said, well, she'd really like to objectify the changes that had occurred. And he got a little nervous, yeah. but ultimately he did admit, uh, agree to uh, order the studies. And um, he mentioned that because she was still a little bit neutropenic, maybe some gentle chemotherapy might still be a consideration. Nonetheless, she refused. After a couple months, her white counts had normalized. By a year, she's doing great. We sent her back got a, f a whole uh, you know, follow-up uh, evaluations. And at that point we decided that um, it was time to try to write up the report. So we wrote up this uh, case report and we submitted it to a, a British medical journal. And after some back and forth, they eventually did uh, publish mm. the paper. They had asked us if we could get the oncologist to sign on. And so we wrote him a letter and it, you know, thanked him so much for all the confidence he had shown in referring the patient to us for fasting. And, uh, Which he didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, in spirit. Uh -huh. And uh, so, uh, but unfortunately he hasn't gotten around to responding to us yet. So mm -hmm. we didn't- we So how long, how long ago was this? Uh, well, what happens, we published that paper and then they asked us to do a follow-up. Cause they said, you know, about 10% of lymphoma patients will go through periods of remissive state, but sustaining it would be impressive. So we followed this patient for three years and she continued, she had lost uh, substantial weight. She had maintained that weight loss for three years. I think in part, because I explained to her that, you know, she had to stick to the diet or it could be fatal because I'd track her down and kill her. And I believe, think she believed me because she stuck to the diet. Uh, and uh, at three years, we got a whole body CT follow up with the oncologist and she's completely cancer free. Uh, at that point, um, we submitted back to uh, the British Medical Journal, which had invited us to do the follow-up. They actually refused the, the article the first time we, we appealed and resubmitted, and then they did decide mm. to publish the follow-up. One of the reviewers felt like, well, maybe she just got lucky. So, but anyway, so she resolved her problem. She maintained it for three years. We now have a four year and now we're working on a five year follow-up. Wow. She continues to do well. Now, since then, and since the publication of that article, we've managed to treat a number of patients with various stages, including stage four lymphoma. And so far the results look very promising. We have some follow-up data now. We're getting in the, uh, we're in the process of submitting another case report with long-term follow-up on a 
stage four follicular lymphoma. And ultimately, we're hoping to publish enough case reports that we can um, do a clinical trial. That's amazing. We can justify a clinical trial because I think we're going to do very well with this condition in highly motivated, self-selected patients that are willing to do dangerous and radical things like eat well mm -hmm. and exercise and go to bed on time. The results seem to be promising. What led you back in the 80s to to basically open this clinic that's premised upon fasting. Like what, what was it about your education or your experience that, you know, that, that you know, you found this protocol and what led you to believe in it, in its efficacy? Well, yeah, it was, uh, it was deep frustration um, being constantly beaten by Dr. Lyle in basketball. Uh -huh. I grew up with Dr. Lyle since fourth grade and we played basketball and, and he would beat me and I- Oh, I, you've known him your whole life. Oh, my oh, whole life. I didn't life, know that, wow. Whole life. And you know, it was really frustrating because he's really good. So, and he's just naturally got tremendous talent. So I just thought, well, I've got to be able to beat him somehow. And so I started reading some books. I came across a book by Herbert Shelton and it made sense. The idea that, you know, health was a result of healthful living and that diet played a role. So I thought, well, I'll get an edge. And I adopted this diet vigorously and lifestyle vigorously thinking this was gonna allow me to be, and of course it failed miserably because he adopted the same kind of eating pattern. Mm -hmm. He still beats me to this day. Here we are 61 years old playing basketball. I still can't manage to beat him. Your whole life is basically a result of you trying to beat, trying to beat Dr. Lyle. <laughs> okay. You know, and, it's, and it's frustrating, I picked the wrong guy. I didn't uh -huh. realize that you know, the person I'm trying to beat just, you know. This was, bookish Stanford psychologist, oh, how hard could it be? You know, I thought, finally I was getting desperate. I thought, well, I, I, you know, he's too quick. He's got, I can't, but maybe I I can beat him in a free throw shooting mm -hmm. contest. Cause I thought, you know, free throws is just practice, right? So for six months I go out, I'm shooting 500 free throws a day, really working on my form. And I just casually one day say, hey, Doug, why don't we do a free throw shooting contest? Uh -huh. And he says, okay, you know, he hasn't even played for a week. Well, he he strikes me as a as a as like a world-class sandbagger. Like oh. the guy who's always gonna tell you that he's no good, right? He's always downplaying, right? That's his whole strategy for all of this. I go out and hit 48 <laughs> out of 50 yeah. and I'm thinking, I got it. He hits 19, misses one, and then hits 80 in a row. 80 free throws in a row. In a row, 99 out of, of course wow. I'm telling him, well, what a choke. If you can hit 99, why don't you just hit a hundred? Uh -huh. I mean, yeah. So the point is it total failure, got involved trying to be a better basketball player. But what I would say is that we're both still playing. And so, you know, how good you can become in a sport may largely be dependent on genetics and luck. How long you're gonna live in life may be largely dependent on genetics and luck, but how well you're gonna live in the time you have left may be dependent on what you put in your mouth and the diet and lifestyle choices that you make. And so what we're trying to explain to patients is you're not gonna live forever, you're gonna die. There's been uh, 100, over 100 billion humans, modern humans born on the planet. There's 7.3 or 4 billion alive today, but there's only been five well-documented people that have lived past 117. So the thing is, you're not gonna live forever, but you don't have to spend the average 9.6 years of debility or 17 years in poor health that the average American is spending. You know, um, giving up compromise in the, the last decades of life that could be your richest decades of life because of chronic degenerative diseases, because we haven't taken control of our diet, sleep and exercise patterns. And that's what we're trying to point is you may not be able to live forever, but you can reduce dramatically the years of debility that you have, your vulnerability to infectious disease, your likelihood of get, developing heart attack, stroke and other debilitating conditions. That's where the big payoff is. Not living forever, but living well until you die, mm -hmm. having a good life and then having a good death. All right, so how does the fasting come in though as so, a pathway towards that? So fasting is interesting because you're dealing with people that are oftentimes addicted to the artificial stimulation of dopamine in their brain, whether it's to drugs or dietary issues, fasting is a great way of breaking that cycle. It can be a very effective way of getting the person to the point where good foods taste good. It's a great way of lowering the blood pressure enough you can eliminate the, di the medications along with the chronic cough, fatigue, the impotence and premature death mm -hmm. that's associated with them. Normalizing the blood sugar levels so your insulin levels normalize so you don't have the cravings and the binging and all the other stuff that sometimes go along with it. Or in autoimmune diseases, oftentimes pain uh, is significant, inflammation and so like People can't be active. They can't dissipate their tension. They aren't able to engage effectively. And so when you get people out of pain, it's like an epiphany experience. And now the motivation goes up. It's hard to be motivated to make diet and lifestyle changes when you feel like crap all the time. But when you get a taste of feeling good again, it's very motivating. 
And now oftentimes that's enough motivation to help people overcome their addictions and their tendencies. The reality is I found the most effective patients are those who are most motivated. Mm. And motivations that are the most powerful is pain, debility, and fear of death. Yeah, 100%. The only problem is, you know, a lot of these people, they get out of pain and they're not fearing death anymore. And then they might slip slide a little bit because they think I'm better now. I don't have to work quite so hard. So, you know, there's there's challenges on both sides. But yeah. the reality but you is- You guys have had a tremendous success with getting, with keeping people on the path. Like the recidivism rate for you is pretty low uh, well, compa- compared to other- In fairness though, you know. we have highly motivated self-selected yeah. people. I mean, people. People are, are coming willing to, you to in fast. really bad shape. Well, they're motivated they're willing, by pain. Yeah, it's, it's one thing to talk about intermittent fasting or you know, a fasting mimicking protocol. It's another thing altogether to talk about a 40 day water fast. Well, I mean, that is a very extreme Moses, thing. Moses, David, Elijah, Jesus, <laughs> okay. and our patients right. you know, do fasting. It you know, is interesting not, that fasting is a, you know, shows up in all these various religious traditions. Isn't it interesting? The Jews, the Jains, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Christians, all these religions that diametrically opposed on so many things that are killing each other in the street over disagreements, they have one thing in common, and that's a tradition about fasting. Because fasting changes how you feel about yourself and the world around you. It can't help it. And so True North Health Center is not coming from a spiritual orientation. We're coming from a very much of a health orientation. We have different doctors with different backgrounds mm. and we don't try to impose our beliefs on anybody because we're not the experts in you know, how you get into heaven or any of that stuff. Our focus is health from healthful living, but virtually every major religion has a tradition. I would mention not just about fasting, but also about the value of a whole plant food diet. You know, these um, traditions resonate uh, throughout history. And, you know, the reality is perhaps it's because that's what works. How dare you? <laughs> all right, so walk me through, all right, well, first let me say this. So in the, in the decades that you've been doing this, you and Doug have taken, and, and your staff, I mean, I've had, I've had, you know, Chef AJ in here explain to me her, you know, experience of, of being at, she goes to True North like for vacation when she wants to get, get out of town. I mean, she, she's she gotta be your most regular customer. Um, but I've had, I've had Dr. Longo talking about fasting. Uh, who else have I had in here? I've had, you know, True North, True North comes up all the time on the podcast. So I've heard about it anecdotally. And over the years you've taken what, like 20,000 people through this fasting procedure you know, and had tremendous success. So I wanna understand the, the process that is entailed here. Somebody comes to you, they're in bad shape, they're overweight, they have hypertension, diabetes, obese, cardiovascular disease, whatever, you know, this is the kind of person that's arriving in your doorstep. So the first step is that they usually go to our website. Mm. So they go to truenorthhealth.com and they fill out the registration forms, which gets us their medical history. And we get their previous laboratory work. That comes in and they get a free phone conversation with me. So we offer people free. You ability. still do that, right? I like still people do can that. call up and you'll give them a free consult. I still do that. So I talk to them as a screening about whether or not fasting might be appropriate. If anything that we do or we recommend might be helpful. For many people, um, they may not even need or be ready for fasting, but they may just need to talk to a doctor that's not a complete idiot. And so we have a phone coaching service where our attendings are available. They go online through the website. We have all their medical records put together. They can schedule a formal mm-hmm. uh, phone com- uh, consultation with one of our attending physicians. They can discuss, get a second opinion. They can do whatever they wanna do where they talk to a doctor that can look at their history objectively and give them advice. Um, if there are appropriate candidates for fasting, then I schedule them into the uh, center for a stay. I give them an idea about what we expect is a reasonable period of time. Um, they come to the center, they go through with one of our attending physicians, a history exam, laboratory monitoring. We, we uh, initiate them into a fasting protocol if that's appropriate. And then after fasting, they go through a refeeding process. Now, while they're there fasting, they're seen twice a day by our staff doctors. We make sure it's done safely and effectively. They're monitored carefully. We have detailed educational classes, what I call brainwashing, uh-huh. where they're able to go through all in detail, the process about what they're gonna need to do, why they're gonna need to do it. There's some social dynamics because they're there with other people from around the world that are getting a chance to do this. You know, our facility has about 70 patients staying at it. So they're interacting with those other people plus the, the staff. 
uh, and the educators. And so it's a pretty like immersion type of an experience. They go through fasting, they go through refeeding. If they have uh, specific health problems, we have chiropractors, naturopaths, mm. body workers, all that kind of stuff that they can get the kind of attention that they need. And then when they're going home, they have very specific recommendations that we expect them to follow. And we try to provide yeah. follow-up support. And then because of the phone coaching, they're able to continue to access these attending doctors uh, affordably without necessarily, because you know half our people are out of state, 15% are foreign. They're not all living locally where they can pop in and right. see our doctors or use our deli business or you know any of that kind of stuff. What are, what are the important vectors or variables that determine the appropriateness or you know for somebody to do one of these protocols? Like not everybody is suitable for this. No, the biggest one is that they have a condition that is appropriate for fasting. So there's many uh, people that are not good candidates for fasting. And we can talk about that. There are some things that are particularly amenable to fasting. And for example, the conditions that are caused by dietary excess are particularly responsive to fasting. It makes sense. Obesity, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type two diabetes, autoimmune diseases, certain forms of cancer. Mm. These conditions we know are made much worse by poor dietary choices. So it's not shocking to find out that fasting, kind of the ultimate in undoing the consequence of excess mm -hmm. would facilitate the recovery of those patients. And it does, and we've been able to prove that. We've been publishing papers looking at these conditions like high blood pressure, looking mm. at diabetes, looking at autoimmune diseases. Mm. And the fact is we can in highly motivated patients generate uh, safe and effective uh, responses with fasting. Right. In fact, we've actually published a fasting safety study, the first comprehensive look at long-term water-only fasting and what the risks are and aren't uh, in response to this process. So we've been able to show it is a safe process when it's done according to protocol. In fact, Dr. Longo, who cautions people in his book about long-term water fasting and its safety, makes an exception. And that's if people fast at the True North Health Center because oh, he's familiar yeah. with our safety data. Now I evaluate other scientists' uh -huh. intelligence based on how much they agree with me. Right, So I consider Good. him a I'm genius. Glad to, I'm glad to know your bias is, <laughs> is intact here. Um, if somebody has anorexia nervosa or if somebody is... Uh -huh. Uh, you know, on the other side of chemotherapy where they're maintaining their weight is an issue. I would suspect that that's probably not a great candidate. What about somebody who's coming in and they're on a battery of medications? You would, ha you would have to wean them off of that, I would presume on some level before they could undergo this. Yeah, you know, there's um, most medications, you do not water fast while you're taking medications. Those have to be weaned down beforehand. But we have physicians that are experts at helping people unwind the uh -huh. consequences of their medical treatment. And most medications, interestingly enough, the day you change the diet, you have to begin changing the medication profile. Right. Because the, most the people medications are, are treating the, the diet. Most basically. people are being treated, that is medicated for their diet. Mm. When you change their diet, the need for medication dramatically responds. You have to reduce the, the blood pressure medication. You start right. crashing these patients because they're not going to be hypertensive once you eliminate the reasons why they're hypertensive. And the, they're not going to be needing the same level of medication once you normalize their dietary intake as far as their diabetes or getting them off their pain medication. Once they don't have the pain, they don't need to be on all that oxy because now the pain is being reduced because the inflammation is being reduced because of the dietary change and then ultimately the fasting. So that's one of the reasons why fasting does need to be done in a controlled medically supervised setting. It's not the kind of thing that you do long-term fasting uh, in a, uh, at home. At home, right. You know, so mm -hmm. you do that in a controlled setting where there's been a proper history, exam, lab, and daily monitoring. So we're seeing each of these patients twice a day, and that's how we're able to ensure that this is a safe and effective experience. Right. So they, they may withdraw their medication, with careful feeding, initiate the fasting, normalize the condition, and then after we're done, most of the time there's no need for medication. Because their blood pressure, you know, they've gone from 220 over 120, capped out on five meds, to being 120 over 70 off medication. Mm. And so there's no reason for anybody to want to put them back on right. drugs that cause chronic cough, fatigue, impotence, and premature death <laughs> uh -huh. if the condition's actually normalized. Now, the side problem is you have to keep on the healthy diet and lifestyle. Yeah. Because you're not curing anything, you're just managing it. But you've rebooted this operating system and wiped the slate clean so you can build a new foundation. It's for very those much habits. like treating a, you know, when your computer becomes corrupted yeah. and you don't know exactly what's wrong, but you turn the thing off, you turn it on, you can't explain, but now it's working. Right. And it seems when to in be doubt, that way. reboot. And we're trying to figure out exactly what those changes are that's occurring. 
uh, in fasting. The, I know the pharmaceutical industry is very interested in what's happening because they want to come up with what are called fasting mimicking drugs. They want drugs that'll do just what fasting does to you, but without that nasty fasting. Yeah. That's something that they can sell in a pill. Yeah. So a lot of the research that's of interest is trying to figure out what exactly is it that's happening in fasting that's allowing the body to get well so that we can try to reproduce that without having to go through the process. Right, I mean, that's my next series of questions. Like, does it have to be water only? What is it about that deprivation protocol that is so special um, you know, uh, physiologically that is causing this cascade of positive impacts? Like what would happen if you were eating a little bit? I mean, I know Longo has his fasting, fasting mimicking um, protocol where he is allowing people to eat something like, I don't know, 600 calories a day. And he's able to reap some of the benefits of what you're experiencing without having to go on a complete water fast. But what is happening to the body when you're depriving it of food in such a you know comprehensive way? Yeah, the intermittent fasting protocols are just that fasting mimicking diets or fasting mimicking programs, trying to reproduce some of the changes that we know occur with fasting without the risk profile or the complications of mm -hmm. long-term water only fasting. And I think they can be very effective as they've demonstrated. However, uh, long-term water only fasting has a much more profound impact on these mechanisms that are associated with fasting. Um, for example, uh, just the most obvious is weight loss. You know, when you're water fasting, you're gonna lose an average of a pound a day. Now, some people say, well, you lose weight, but then you gain it back afterwards. Now, interesting, we've done a study. We have now uh, recently acquired a, a Hologix DEXA scanner with the new software that allows you to do a whole body detail composition. It looks not just at percent body fat, but how much visceral fat there is. And we have a paper that'll be coming out that looks at the fact that yes, you lose a bunch of weight fasting and you regain some weight after fasting, but it turns out the weight you regain after fasting when you're eating a whole plant food diet is exclusively water, fiber, glycogen, and protein. Mm. There is no fat. In fact, the fat profile continues to drop during mm. refeeding, even though the scale weight obviously goes up as you rehydrate, put some fiber back into the right. diet. As long as you adopt. As the, long as you continue right. to adopt yeah. the whole plant food, healthy you know, uh -huh. dietary style. But the point that the old wives tell was, well, you lose fat and you just gain the fat right back. Well, that might be true if you go back to eating greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh processed foods, but that's not what's happening in these patients that were refeeding feeding appropriately. Mm -hmm. And so weight goes up, but what the weight that goes up is re your glycogen stores and, and muscle uh, stores, right. which is really exciting. So preferentially, not just do you lose fat, but you preferentially lose visceral fat, that the ratio of uh, visceral fat to adipose tissue loss is 3.0. In other words, it's, there's a significant preferential mobilization of this very mm. type of fat that we think is most compromising to health. The fat, the abdominal fat, the fat right. that stores around the organs. So now we have what may turn out to be an effective strategy of specifically mobilizing visceral fat. Now we've done some preliminary work. We we're actually enrolling patients in a study starting in August, looking specifically at body composition changes long-term mm. with follow-up. So you know we'll be able to speak more definitively about it uh, by the end of the year. Um, there's also a process that happens in water fasting that you don't see as profoundly influenced in juice diets or modified uh, di uh, diets, and that's naturesis. There's a selective mobilization and elimination of excess sodium from the body in water fasting that happens right away. It's very powerful, more powerful than say taking hydrochlorothiazide or a diuretic. And it's responsible for the big dump in fluids that happens initially on fasting that drops blood pressure so dramatically, gets rid of the congestive heart failure symptoms that eliminates some of the arthritic symptoms and joint swelling and the non-healing wounds. And this body selectively getting rid of this excess sodium that's accumulated that the body's mm. having to deal with because of the dietary choices. Um, the traditional justification for fasting was the idea of detoxification. This idea that there's toxins in the body. And now we know that's true. They've actually been able to that's take- That's controversial. Well, it's actually not controversial in the sense that you can take a fat biopsy of a human and break it down and you'll find there's hundreds of different chemicals there at various concentrations, PCB, dioxin, pesticide residues, mercury. And the, the only thing that's controversial is they say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it turns out it does matter. It just matters mm. at different thresholds to different people. And so this, this idea of rapidly mobilizing toxins during fasting has been so 
uh, well accepted by some that they say that's the reason not to fast is the body would rapidly mobilize these fat soluble nutrients too quickly and your body wouldn't know what it's doing and it would overload your system unless you take their proprietary products then apparently mm. it's okay but what our experience has been that there is a rapid detoxification we know that there's some studies looking at they've even done total body load measurements before and after fasting and showed that pcb levels would drop um, Clinically, clear. Well, you're not taking any chemicals into your body and you're allowing the liver and the kidneys to just do what they do, right? But it's more than just what you would calculate through burning 2,000 calories of internal fluids. There's a selective and rapid mobilization. For example, with tumors, let's say you have a breast tumor and you lose 10% of your body weight. You would assume that you'd probably lose 10% of your tumor weight. But what happens in the, for example, in lymphoma, you lose 100% of the tumor. Mm -hmm. So the body's preferentially mobilizing some nutrient stores versus others. And it seems to be able to do that in inverse proportion to the value of those tissues to the body. Right. So it's getting the visceral fat, which we think isn't probably healthful fat, before it's uh, mobilizing adipose fat, or and certainly before it's getting to critical nerve tissues and other things that are preserved. The body has an intelligence where it's unwinding itself. And what we're suggesting is it appears that both endogenous and exogenous toxins are preferentially mobilized in water-only fasting at a much more powerful rate than they are, say, when you're going on a healthy diet mm. and lifestyle. And that may be a, way, a justification for trying to facilitate and speed this process. There's also the effect on enzymatic induction. Think about athletes. One of the things of being a trained athlete is you induce, for example, glyconogenolytic enzyme systems, you get better at mobilizing glycogen stores. And you know this whole mm. business of carb loading and trying to increase uh, 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 glycogen storage so you have more to pull on so that you don't hit the wall so quickly when you're running that marathon or whatever, mm -hmm. you get through that process. Though that is in, induced with persistent exercise. The same enzymatic production for glycogen, for lipolytic enzymes, for uh, protein, for gluconeogenesis enzyme systems is induced during fasting. Because you have to mobilize all your glycogen right. stores. You're That's emptying the chamber. You're taking that battery and draining it all the way down. And it, and it suggested that not only do you induce uh, improved efficiency of enzyme systems, but they persist after fasting, which is just like you get better and better at exercising every time you do it. You get better and better at fasting every time you do it, which is perhaps one of the justifications for intermittent fasting. If you fast 16 hours every day, and you limit your feeding window to an eight hour window, you may be inducing some changes in that, even that limited fast, that 16 hour fast, day after day after week after month, cumulatively, that may have a very profound effect on body physiology. And that's mm. one of the suggestions that's being made by those advocating intermittent fasting or short periods of fasting right. that cumulatively it may be. Well, when you do a long-term fast, this is a huge impact. And now this is some of the stuff we're working with people like uh, Luigi Fontana from Washington University, where they're looking at changes in microbiome, changes in whole body composition, changes in these, these various exotic biomarkers and what happens in short-term and long-term fasting. Nobody knows yet because we're really the only people doing and monitoring long-term water-only fasting and its physiological effects. Right. So this is all virgin data and very exciting. But what we can see clinically is that when you induce changes with exercise or you induce changes with fasting, they're often the same changes. If you look, for example, exercise, people that exercise two rats in a cage, genetically identical, give one rat an exercise wheel and the other not. Everything else is equal. The rats with the exercise wheel, one, they'll use it. And number two, they don't get Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And they said, well, why? Why does exercise prevent, how does exercise prevent dementia? And they look at those rats and they find out that BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is dramatically higher in rat, rats that get their exercise, lower in those that don't, the ones that don't, much more vulnerable to Alzheimer's. Well, BDNF, it turns out, the precursor to that is beta-hydroxybutyric acid, which is the fatty acid that your brain is preferentially mobilizing during water-only fasting. BDNF goes up with water fasting just like it does in exercise. Glycogen wow. mobilizing enzymes go up in exercise just like they do in fasting. In fact, all of the biomarkers that we've been able to look at that are improved with exercise, improve with fasting, which is weird because you think, well, wait That's a second, wild. exercise, you're out vigorously running around inducing all these changes. Fasting, you're sitting around, we don't even let you exercise much. You maybe could do a little yoga. How is it that they would do the same thing to the body? But when you think about it, exercise and fasting are both reversing the consequences of dietary excess. 
When you exercise vigorously, when you fast, you're undoing the consequence of diatrexis. I'm not surprised at all that fasting induces the same kind of bio changes that we see with exercise. In fact, for us, it's saving a lot of time because we just look at all that fast exercise literature and start looking for the things they've discovered and seeing how much of it's mimicking, mimicked with fasting. Um, I think that both of these processes, fasting and exercise, share a common biological benefit. And that's why we're seeing the biomarkers changing with both. That is crazy. The other thing that happens is insulin. Insulin is the hormone that drives sugar from the bloodstream into the cells where it's needed to burn. So if you look at type two diabetics, you might assume mistakenly that they don't have enough insulin. They have plenty of insulin, they have more insulin. It doesn't work because there's insulin resistance. There's resistance to the insulin carrying out its function. So what drug can you take that reverses insulin resistance? There isn't any. There's drugs that'll force sugar on the cell and they have all kinds of side effects. What can you do to reduce insulin resistance? Well, you could exercise, mm -hmm. you know, that helps. Weight loss, healthy diet. Um, you can fast. Fasting has a profound effect on insulin resistance. In fact, as much as 80% of our type two diabetics can achieve normal blood sugar levels without medication. And if they're willing to continue to do the diet and the exercise, they can often sustain those results. Now, you might say, well, couldn't they do that with just diet and exercise? Absolutely. Many diabetics that are able to make aggressive diet and lifestyle changes over enough time are successful at resolving and reversing their diabetes, but it's difficult. For people that aren't able to do it on their own, that's where we would use mm -hmm. the next level of support and intervention, which is fasting. It can also be a little tricky unwinding the medications and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, doing whatever it is, whether it's feeding or fasting in conjunction with doctors that are able to be supportive and that have an expectation of you getting well is important. Now think about it. If you go to a doctor and you've lost weight, does the doctor assume you've adopted a healthy diet? No, they assume you've got an eating disorder, you're a drug addict or you're dying of cancer. <laughs> you know, that's the differential, yeah. colon cancer, uh -huh. eating disorder, drug addiction. Because many doctors have never had an experience of a diabetic getting well. I gave a lecture this year in Texas at a, me at a medical conference for physicians who specialize in diabetes. So there's 250 people there. What are they serving them? Pulled pork sandwiches, chocolate cake, you know, most of them are overweight or obese. I do my presentation, I explain our results. Afterwards, one of the docs comes up, he's about maybe 70, 80 pounds overweight. He says, you know, I've been in practice 25 years treating diabetics. I've never seen one get well. Hmm. He's never had the experience of a single patient recovering, stabilizing their blood sugar, getting off medication. It's not part of the paradigm. Well, how likely is he gonna give meaningful diet and lifestyle advice to a patient when he do doesn't do it himself, doesn't believe, doesn't even right. know that it would work, or even if he thought it would work, knows the patient's not gonna do it because people don't make diet and lifestyle changes. He's seen the literature, 93% recidivism rate, that the, you know, you, is, to ask people to make diet and lifestyle changes, very difficult. So because when you get up and you give a presentation like that to that type of audience, what is the receptivity to what you're saying? Well, in the past, it was, uh, aggressively negative. Now it's actually becoming where at least a percentage of the audience is actually interested. Uh -huh. um, the way that we made that contact was one of the doctors that, that runs the residency training program came in, had his own experience, wanted it for his students. And now those second and third year residents can rotate as part of their training at the True North Health Center. So they can get the experience of actually doing something that some of them have never done before, which is see these patients get well because under a conventional treatment, you don't get to do that. And it turns out there's some doctors that rings their bell. They like the idea of a patient's getting well. And so they're willing to put the extra time and energy and effort in. <laughs> right. But if you're in the traditional system, if you're in an HMO system and you're a physician and you have to see 26 patient contacts a day, do you think you have time to review their history, do an exam, write the prescriptions, and then sit and chit chat about them, why they've got to give up everything that they eat? No, the system and adopt isn't set up diet? for that. No. It's not set up for that. They it's not set up for the accountability that's required to get somebody to maintain any kind of lifestyle change protocol anyway. And, and I'm not sure many of them even realize that it's actually worth their time because they've never actually seen it happen before. Mm. So, mm. you know, and of course they, the criticism is, well, yeah, but you're working with special patients. Well, that's true. We're working with the people that are highly motivated, self-selected, willing to make diet and lifestyle changes. It is a self, I'm not saying you can take our advice, give it to everybody and everybody's yeah. just gonna go, oh, great, a whole plant food diet, just what I wanted. That's not the reality. But for people that are willing and interested, they should at least have the right. Somebody that should at least say, well, 
you could go on this diet and lifestyle, you know, but it's a lot of work. Or you right. can just take these pills and you'll be sick forever. What, what do you want to do? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. but they don't even know that. It's not. I can guarantee you this physician I was talking to never tells his patients. Well, if you did radical and diet lifestyle changes, you could get. Well, I'll give you an example. My brother. My brother's six years older, so we're raised together. He's slowly gaining weight. His wife adopts our diet, comes in and fast, overcomes her own health issues. Is on a vegan program. Fifteen years later, my brother's still eating chicken and doing stuff and getting uh-huh. fatter, and he's got and he can't do, play volleyball anymore. His legs all swollen up. I, you know, I'm poking him, but he he won't do anything. Finally, he calls me from the hospital. He says, "Alan, I'm in the hospital. I had a heart attack." I said, "That's great." <laughs> he goes, "No, no, no. You don't hear. I had a heart attack." Uh-huh. I said, "I heard you." Best thing that could have happened. So he said, "Oh, they want to do a quadruple bypass and." I said, well, talk to your surgeon. He asked the surgeon, he says, if you do a bypass, won't they plug up again? And the surgeon said, yeah, eventually, but you know, it lasts longer than stents. And he says, what if I made radical diet and lifestyle change? <laughs> he said, the surgeon laughed at him. Hmm. He said, Mark, you're not going to make diet and lifestyle changes. Come on. Checked himself out, got on a whole plant food SOS free diet lost the 50 pounds, back to playing volleyball, passed his stress test, still has his vessels. Wow. But my own brother, it took yeah, it's willingness. pain, ability, and fear it's, of death. It's, it's just like in 12 step, it's like, it's all about willingness. And pain is, is the fulcrum for that, right? When people are in a desperate state or they've suffered a, you know, a, a severe medical you know, trauma like that, then they're ready to actually implement those kinds of changes. Short of that, it's very difficult. And I think that speaks to the pessimism that most practitioners have about the, you know, the viability of advising somebody to change their lifestyle habits. Absolutely, I completely understand. This is amongst the most difficult thing you can ask a patient to do. Adopt a health promoting diet in a world designed to make you fat, sick and miserable. Not an easy task, certainly not for sissies. And in my brother's case, you know, he had the advantage. His wife, my sister-in-law, already doing the work mm. of providing support to the family with healthy food and stuff, but still difficult. Now, I just saw him a few days ago. Looks great. Uh-huh. Completely different person. Do you think he's going to like, oh, no, it was, wasn't worth it. I mean, you know, no, right. it's the best thing he's ever done. Fabulous. So you you approach fasting from a perspective of, of – um, weight management and also disease prevention and reversal, but there's all also all this emerging science around longevity and, and anti-aging. Of course, that's Longo's you know specific lens on this. But by dint of autophagy and all these other you know uh, like sort of you know biomechanical systems that are affected by fasting, there's now this whole world of research opening up around prolonging life as a result of this. I actually think the people that are gonna turn out to get the most benefit from fasting, this one and two week fast that we do with healthy people is healthy people. Healthy people that are looking to stay healthy. To avo- for example, to avoid vulnerability to infectious disease, to avoid the problems that, you know, not waiting like my brother did till he has a heart attack, but the people that are willing to use it to prevent the problems from beginning. And interestingly enough, I've been communicating with Walter Longo recently about mm. doing a joint study where we're gonna use his expertise and um, uh, access and our facility to do some look, not just at intermittent fasting, but long-term fasting and compare and contrast and see what the very best bang for the buck, so to speak of, is in terms of taking healthy people and helping them stay that way. We've got a study that's planned for next year, looking specifically at exotic biomarker changes with these dietary changes, with fasting, and then trying Uh to differentiate how much fasting, how frequently, what's the right combination. That's all relatively new uh, territory. You know, there's other impacts of fasting that are not as well recognized. For example, the gut. You have a tunnel through your body that starts at your mouth and it goes down your esophagus and then your stomach and your intestinal tract and gets to the rectum. You got a hole at one end and another hole at the other end. And digestion is essentially shoving things in one hole, trying to push it out the other hole. But it's only the stuff that gets absorbed through your intestinal mucosa that enters the body. And that intestinal mucosa acts like a screen keeping flies out if the screen becomes inflamed things can leak through. That's essentially what gut leakage is. And the things that cause inflammation of the gut, we believe are free radicals that come from not just smoking or drinking alcohol. You know, smoking, it's obvious. You see smoker's face, cross-linked collagen tissues. We know that's cross-linkaging from the free radicals from smoking. Mm -hmm. It also affects the animal lining of the blood vessels. It's my contention that cigarette smoking may protect people from getting lung cancer. 
that's, actually that's a, protects that's a people. Radical from, statement. Well, think about it. Eighty percent of How smokers. How can you say that? Come on. Eighty percent of smokers never get lung cancer, and twenty percent of smokers get cancer. And I believe it's because smoking kills people from heart attacks before they live long enough to grow their tumors. Because of the damage to the animal lining of vessels, ca uh, cardiovascular disease may occur slightly quicker than the uh, inevitable lung cancer would have. And so if you could make smoking more dangerous and kill everybody from heart disease, perhaps they could advertise it as cancer safe. <laughs> okay, now I understand. <laughs> well, but, um, you know, they say statistics yeah. don't lie, but liars use statistics. And the fact is you can look at these, this data and twist it around in a way that sounds good, even though it's completely ridiculous. Right. Smoking damages animal lining, it, damage, it causes lung cancer. Alcohol, peroxidation of alcohol leads to cirrhosis of the liver. Why do you think people that drink a lot of alcohol get fatty liver? It's a scar tissue that comes from the detoxifying effect of that nasty alcohol. But today they're trying to tell you that alcohol is health food. If you don't drink, you should start. That resveratrol, the little bit of powerful mm. antioxidant from this great skin is some justification for drinking alcohol. They're trying to tell you, oh, it thins the blood like aspirin does. So if you're on a greasy, fatty, slimy, dead decaying flesh diet and risk of clotting stroke, that thinning effect is gonna reduce your risk of dying from a clotting stroke, which might be true, but you're gonna increase your risk from a hemorrhagic stroke, you're not gonna reduce your all-cause mortality. So the only reason to drink alcohol is if you'd rather die of a bleeding stroke than a clotting stroke, maybe that's a justification. Uh -huh. You're a passionate man, Dr. Goldhammer. <laughs> why is it that, uh, why 40 days or 21 days? Like, what is it about that extended period that's so important? Well, what we do is we wanna fast as short as possible, but long enough to get the problem resolved. And so it's not like we're setting out to try to beat Jesus in, the, in fasting duration. Um, we don't go over 40 days generally, because if you keep the fast under 40 days, there's few metabolic complications. As you start getting into the really long fast, the 60 days, the 80 days, the longer fast that were done in the past, it's a much more delicate balance in terms of electrolyte balance and other things. Mm. And so uh, the guy that I trained with Alec Burton in Australia used to do fast as long as 100 days or longer. And I asked him, by the time I got there, that was um, 36 years ago, he was no longer doing over 40 days as a routine, just very mm -hmm. occasionally. And I said, why? And he said, well, because of the sleep deprivation. I said, oh, I didn't know that patients had any more trouble sleeping on long-term fast. He goes, oh no, not the patients, me. He out had of, sleep deprivation. He was fear. just worried too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he'd worry too much about yeah, it. So yeah. he, he decided to keep it to 40 days because we knew from experience that that was the period of time you could go without getting into more mm -hmm. of the complications. So and we, there's no electrolyte supplementation or vitamin and mineral supplementation during this period? You're looking at me like I'm there's <laughs> crazy. Water only fasting is the uh -huh. complete abstinence of all substances except pure water in an environment is of complete rest. Is there a particular kind of water? We use fractionally steamed distilled water just because it's pure water. Patients that are fasting get really sensitive. They won't tolerate municipal contamination and mm. other stuff. They just want pure water. It's H2O. It's just what rainwater would be if the environment wasn't mm -hmm. polluted. Um, and so anytime you start supplementing, like for example, there were some long-term fasts done by medical authorities that, that killed people. And the reason why is because they supplemented. What they would do is they would supplement potassium if potassium got low. But if you don't allow something to be the rate limiting nutrient and you're not measuring obviously everything that's possible to be measured, you can get into depletion of something else. And they did. And you see evidence in the literature of myocardial fibril breakdown or other problems that you'll not see if you don't let the rate limiting nutrients be rate limiting. For example, potassium is pretty sensitive. If you don't supplement potassium and you use potassium as a rate limiting mineral, all the downstream things that you might not necessarily know to measure are not likely mm -hmm. to become an issue. So mm -hmm. we use 3.0 potassium as, as an arbitrary termination. If it gets below that, then we modify the protocol. Now, it's not necessary to do that. You could push people further, but if you use that as a protocol, we've proven you can do it safely and effectively over 20,000 consecutive times. Mm -hmm. The reason why we've been able to do this so consistently is we have strict protocols that we follow that are time tested and proven. And supplementation of electrolytes, although you might think, well, potassium's low, we'll just give them some potassium. But that's an example of letting arrogance exceed your ignorance because you don't know what the downturn consequences yeah, yeah, yeah. of that is. And so we're using a protocol that we've been able to test. Now, it may be there's a better way to do it. And that's why we do research. And that's why we look at these things or maybe, but until that's done, I, I exercise caution right. uh, because um, the fact is this is a, 
you're in a physiologically vulnerable state, particularly in a person that's coming off medications and has a health history. And you want to make sure that everybody that walks in walks out. And that's why we use the protocol we do. I would suspect also a psychologically delicate state. Walk me through the experience of this journey that you see with the typical patient. I mean, you're demanding a lot of them. They're going through something they've never done before. Like, what is the, you know, what it, what is that like for that individual when they're on day three, day ten, day thirty? Yeah. So the first uh, few days of fasting are actually the most difficult because you're adapting off the uh, uh, off a of glucose metabolism into a, a fat metabolism. So the brain is changing fuels from burning sugar to burning largely beta hydroxybutyric acid, which comes from the ketone bodies from the fat breakdown. So there's an adjustment there. You're detoxing oftentimes a lot, although we've learned to minimize the effect of detoxification by getting people to eat a fruit vegetable only diet for a few days before we start mm -hmm. fasting. That's made a huge difference. So they're not coming off caffeine addiction at the same moment that they're trying to adapt to the fast. They've already gotten that stuff out of their system. And that's actually the most difficult stuff, getting mm -hmm. the cigarettes, the caffeine, the alcohol, all the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, dairy products, processed foods, all the host of chemicals that people are putting into their body with over-the-counter prescription medications. So we've gone through a wean down process and then we start fasting. And their mouth may coat up and taste like something crawled in there and died. And they may have some skin rashes or elimination. They may get mucus discharge. They may get um, some vivid dreams. They may have aches and pains and they may have difficulties with all kinds of adaptive processes, but they go away. And then something else comes along and then it goes away. And then it becomes very empowering because they realize that they're able to get through this process that just because they had a headache doesn't mean they have to rush out and try to suppress those symptoms with a pill. It goes away, the body's able to heal itself. And then once you get into four or five days of fasting, the body's pretty well acclimated to the fasting. At this point, there's no hunger. People are going to cooking demonstrations. They're coming to lectures. They're going to the dining room to socialize with people. They're five days, 10 days into a fast. You think, oh my God, you haven't eaten for 10 days? No, uh -huh. I just enjoy being there. That's it's crazy. not a problem. Um, so then um, depending on the patient, sometimes they start getting relief. Their pain, maybe for the first time in years, the pain that they've been suffering with is going away. And they may find that, uh, you know, some people who have these chronic debilitating problems start resolving. Things start falling off, tumors start shrinking. They start getting excited, like, oh, maybe there's something to this idea of the body healing itself. And you know, we're monitoring these patients to go through the process. And then at some point, you get to the point where there's a, a limiting factor. Maybe their electrolytes start to drop a little bit or their energy is not mm. acceptable. They're not able to maintain adequate ambulation. Or maybe they've just got, that's how much time they've got. Cause you know, some people have jobs and lives and right. responsibilities. So we only have so much time <laughs> here to for with. 40 days. <laughs> yeah. So well, my life completely craters on the outside. But for many people, this is an intense epiphanic experience because they've got this intense education that they're really open to. Mm. They've seen these other people, sometimes what looks to them like miracles going on because they're seeing people that they have no expectation that that could get well, getting well. They're experiencing themselves sometimes for the first time, you know, a sense of empowerment because they're able to actually yeah. reverse these processes that they were told nothing could be done, learn to live with it. What do they expect at their age? That's just how it is. And now they're thinking, wow, if they were wrong about that, maybe they're wrong about other things too. And yeah, they start yeah, yeah. You know, looking at all aspects of their life. The empowerment aspect of it, has got to be huge. Like even if you set aside all of these, you know, physical benefits that are a result of this, simply the fact that they did something that seems impossible, very very difficult, and get to the other side of it, has to, you know, sort of um, make them feel like, okay, now nothing is impossible. Like I just did this thing that almost nobody does. Now, so, now, what's the next challenge that I can tackle? You know, the idea is that many people think that if you fast, you die. They believe if they got on a plane in New York and they were to fly all the way to California, they would die over Colorado, <laughs> except they ate the peanuts. Yeah. You know, that the pretzels saved their life. Like, what that, do you eat when you fly? And somehow if you fasted for 10 days or 20 days, sometimes the idea that you might have to skip a meal because there was nothing healthy to eat doesn't seem quite so overwhelming. There's definitely empowerment. Mm. And I think that the other thing that happens is when you start feeling what it feels like to be you instead of what you'd become, that's very important. I think the same thing happens to athletes. You know, when people first start exercising at first, it's not pleasant. 
they got aches, they got pains, they, they're fatigued, they're not, they're not getting the success, they can't do what they want. But as they do it, they get to the point where not only do they tolerate, they're not just doing it because they want to you know, maintain the weight or get the figure or whatever it is. They're doing it because they start realizing they're getting real intrinsic benefit from engaging in this consistent activity. And now they don't want to give it up. And I think the same thing happens when people really get into a healthy lifestyle. Yeah, they they're realize invested. They don't want to go give it up and feel like everybody else feels because mm-hmm. of some greasy, slimy, convenient food. They're willing to pay the price of trying to do the planning and do what it takes to try to ensure that they can get their needs met. Just like I think people that get into a regular exercise regime uh, realize that now this is so beneficial, they will literally structure their schedules around making sure that that's an important part of their activity. And the same thing happens with sleep. When you realize how important sleep is to health and maintenance and energy, you start prioritizing that. And you don't compromise your sleep, you don't compromise your exercise, and hopefully you don't you learn to not compromise your diet and lifestyle. I tell people, here's what you need to do. First, get enough sleep, because it's your most critical activity. Then engage in regular exercise so you can dissipate the tension, you can build fitness, and have the time to prepare and eat healthy food. If there happens to be any time left, well, fine, you go to work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, Let's talk about the uh, the food part of all of this. So, uh, well, first of all, does anybody freak out in the middle of this and flee? Like I can't handle it. Like there has to be some people that just psychologically can't handle it. You'd be surprised. By yeah. the time people come to the True North Health Center, they're pretty well vetted. Uh-huh. They've gone through some screening. We've evaluate their history, they're usually pretty motivated. Most of the time, the only way they find out about us is some doctor or somebody they know is referred them to us to begin with. Yeah. And you know, it's like, you're not gonna refer somebody that you, if you know what's going on there, that's not gonna be a good candidate. Uh-huh. So there's a lot of filtration that goes on. And so the exceptions that I've seen, I've had some patients that are coming off drugs like cocaine and other stuff that don't last 12 hours, you know, cause they're right. just, they're not really ready to make the change. <laughs> but as far as fleeing because of diet, no, because the True North Health Center is set up to meet people where they're at. Not everybody's ready to do vigorous water only fasting or should, would it even be appropriate? So for those individuals, maybe we just do a healthy eating regime and just eating the diet, doing the classes, doing the yoga, the meditation mm. is enough to induce significant changes. Sometimes after they've been a while, they might say, well, you know, maybe I'll try a little intermittent fasting or maybe I'll try a little bit of a fast and see how I do with that. And that's fine. So it's not like everybody comes in and we lock them up and that's it. In fact, you know, I tell a story when we first moved to the new facility, one day a really large police officer showed up at the door and he said he wanted to interview one of my patients. And I asked him, what did they do? And they said, well, you know, I don't need to know. And I said, uh-huh. well, if you want me to tell you if they're here or not, I need to know, you know what the issue is. And he said, okay, we got a complaint. And the complaint was from this patient's relatives. And they said they were, that the patient was being held against their will by religious cultists and being starved to death to go uh-huh. to be with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. I thought, I'm saying, look, the person's not here involuntarily. And he yeah. got interviewed. I said, fine, I'll let you interview him. But first, would you like a nice tall cup of Kool Aid? Uh huh, right. And Dr. Lyle says that when a police officer puts like his hand on Like relishing your role as a cult leader. He is not comfortable, and I'm not to speak to authorities anymore. But, That's funny. you know, I'm thinking it's an obvious joke because yeah. Kool Aid's full of sugar. Where would yeah, you serve yeah. that at the True North Health Center? Well, I know, it's funny. The, the reality um, is that today it's not as much of an issue because now the idea of fasting doesn't yeah, seem it's quite very much so in the, It's in the culture extreme. now. In it's a way not that the Jim Jones kind right. of, you know, right. perception. Right. So it's not Are as you still now. the only medically supervised clinic that's doing this? Well, you know, I'm really excited because I just visited yesterday, one of our doctors that trained with us, Nathan Gershfeld, is running a facility here in the Los Angeles area. Mm. And he's, it's beautiful. I, I went to see his uh, facility and it's absolutely beautiful. And for anybody that, uh, you know, and also we have another doctor, uh, uh, Dr. Ewan in Ohio, that's opened up a small facility, is doing really well. I've gotten excellent feedback from people. We have other doctors that we train. We have an intern You're residency like a proud training papa. program. And those schools, I mentioned Texas A&M, there's other medical schools, the naturopathic professions uh, graduates can come and spend a year as, an, as a resident doing a rotation at the True North Health Center. The chiropractors often come and spend three months as part of their training mm-hmm. at the True North Health Center. And those doctors were hoping to open up more facilities around the country. And we make uh, people that contact our website can get access to whoever the local right. uh, fasting supervisors are. And we're happy to provide that 
uh, information. And it's really exciting to see these guys not only learning how to do it, but actually figuring out how to get these places open and offer mm-hmm. affordable care to people. And you know, the thing uh, that it's always gratifying to see the clinical results that they're seeing, because it's really a hard thing to do in an outpatient practice. Yeah. Unless you can control a person's environment, it's hard to really induce these kinds of profound changes. It's gotta be incredibly gratifying as a medical practitioner to see such dramatic results. Well, I think that's one of the reasons we've been successful. We have a dozen clinicians now at the Truman Center. We have five medical doctors. We've got osteopathy, chiropractic, naturopathy, all represented. And these doctors, once they come, they often are with us their entire career. In fact, Dr. Right. Clapper, Clapper just retired yeah. after mm-hmm. nine years at Truman Center. We, we joke that we're like the firm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, once they start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it, but it's because they like the low patient intensity. In other words, they're not having to see high volumes of patients. So they're spending a lot of time with a few people. And Instead of a little time with a lot, they like the the center setup where the doctor is able actually to get all that intense education done without it coming out of the visit time. That they can spend the mm-hmm. visit time really working with the patient's specific needs, and they like the idea that people get well. Mm-hmm. And so the combination of that allows us to keep the doctors, even though they probably work harder for less with us than they would if they went off and worked for the local HMO or whatever it is, that it's enough gratification, enough benefit that those doctors really like working at True yeah. North Health. And what is the what is the kind of current relationship that you have with the conventional you know medical mm-hmm. establishment? Like, how are they perceiving what you're doing? Now? Well, it's been a revolution, actually. It's been amazing change because when Dr. Sultana, who's been with us now about 20 years, came, the first thing we did is we got him to take a job with the local hospital as an urgent care doctor, and so he became known to the medical staff there and the nurses, and he's such a wonderful doctor, they loved him. And so that allowed us to have a good relationship with the immediate, we have a a trauma center, you know, just a mile Mm -hmm. away. And so some of their nurses or patients of ours, we provide chiropractic support to the nurses at that hospital. uh, Some of the hospitalists purchase their food through our outpatient deli. So we have a good working relationship. And now that they're seeing some of our referral uh, patients that we're doing for diagnostic workups and people getting well, that's really helped too, because they're yeah. not used to seeing people actually recover. And so today it's completely different than it was 20 years ago, where we were seen as some mm-hmm. kind of you know, crazy people. Mm-hmm. Now, I think they see it as a little bit odd and different, but at least for people that have whatever it is they see get well, Right. Acceptable, right, right, and right. they know we're well intentioned. The other thing that's made a big difference is we've published a number of papers in peer-reviewed medical literature, including on the safety of fasting, the effect of fasting on high blood pressure. We've recently finished a study with the Mayo Clinic looking at primary prevention of stroke. That's in review right now at a major journal. We're hoping that we'll get positive. Mm. Uh, uh, publication of that here in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've done a study with Luigi Fontana from Washington University looking at bi- uh, biomarker changes in the gut microbiome before and after fasting. Right. Uh, we have a couple other studies that we're in, enrolling in right now. So now we're getting some affiliations with some of these major players like um, Walter Longo, which is gonna allow us to get into journals that we might not otherwise have been able to yeah. access because of the power that these guys bring. Yeah, his, you know, his credibility table. and his pedigree, I, I would imagine is very helpful. Oh, he's done yeah. unbelievable, just fabulous yeah. work. And he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. You know, we're yeah, so yeah. fortunate that you know, we've got these kind of people out there trailblazing into the scientific and medical mm-hmm. literature. Because mm-hmm. uh, as clinicians and particularly alternative health clinicians, we're not always viewed uh, with the most open, uh, mindedness from yeah. much of the medical profession. Yeah. Well, the other big piece here is the diet and nutrition piece. I would suspect that a lot of people come to True North because they saw you and they saw those case studies portrayed in in What the Health, the documentary. We all saw those individuals, their kind of before and after stories that were very dramatic. Um, and a big and heavily part of that, criticized. And heavily, yeah, controversial for uh, sure. We, we have uh, people telling us, I see there's stuff on the internet that says those people were all paid actors. It oh, was really? all, you know, <laughs> reverse Photoshop. Uh, and I've seen some unbelievable- Kip and Keegan criticism. just kind of grabbed them randomly, right? Like how did that happen? <laughs> they, they they showed up and wanted to do the film. So we did some interview and then they came back and they said, well, they've decided they wanted a little more can we just interview some of your patients? And they uh-huh. went out to the courtyard. Just whoever happened to be happened standing to be around. Sta- yeah, I wish right. we could have cherry picked it and stuff. But well, there just- was that one guy he had all his pills, you know, they, he went through all of his medications and all that kind of stuff. The point is that type of experience is pretty routine. Yeah. In True North Health. We see, 
what looks like miracles. It's not miracles at all. It's just getting rid of the crappy diet, instituting a whole plant food SOS free diet and using fasting effectively. You know, that's the reality. Um, And I know they've got a new movie coming out and I know Mm -hmm. they've done a bit of filming with us as well. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm very excited that I think it's September, Netflix decided to do a special on wellness. Oh, they did? And one of their six shows was filmed at the True North Health Center. Oh, wow. And it's on fasting. Who's behind that? Do you know? Um, I can't, I don't recall who the producer and what else, but it's, I know it's purchased by Netflix. Uh It's a Netflix original. Oh, that's cool. You know, so I know it's gonna get pushed out. I had John Lewis in here a couple of weeks ago, um, who's working with with Keegan on the Hungry for Justice project. And so I've been behind the scenes kind of looking at what they're doing. That's gonna be a really big one. I imagine it'll be very controversial yeah. and probably piss a lot of people off. I'm really excited to see it. Keegan, that's, that's Keegan's specialty. Yeah. <laughs> But all right, so the food part, um, the the protocol that you're that you recommend and that you you know, apply with your patients is, you know, owes its debt of legacy to Caldwell Esselstyn and you know a whole legion of those pioneering doctors who have put the whole food plant based diet onto the forefront of public awareness. We've seen it um, grow in adoption and recognition, and we're seeing the benefits of that. I think it's still you know, um, somewhat controversial. There's all these diet wars with the low, low, the low carb people and now ketosis and all of that. So that's kind of all kind of going on in the background here, but maybe you, know, you can just speak to why you believe so strongly in a whole food plant-based diet. Well, the exclusively whole plant food diet, I think is has a lot of support, whether it's John McDougall or uh, Esselstein, or you, you mentioned one of my heroes, um, T. Colin Campbell, mm-hmm. you know, just a brilliant guy. So they all make a very compelling case that people should eat a whole plant food diet. And Essentially, you call it a whole plant food diet. I notice that you always do that instead of calling it a whole food plant based diet. What's the reason for that? So I want a whole I want whole plant food diet because a plant based diet implies that you know it's based it's, on plants, it's, but it's, it allows room it. for it allows flexibility. Interesting. And so I think that Dr. McDougall and Dr. Uh, Campbell would argue that we want to have as broad a diet as possible mm-hmm. to attract as many people as possible. Because remember, most people in the vegan vegetarian movement are not just interested only in health, but actually dominantly in animal rights, moral, ethical, and spiritual reasons, environmental impact. And so their argument is, well, maybe it doesn't have to be Mr. Perfect you know, diet. If it encompasses a broader range of people, we'll get more people doing it. We'll save the planet. We'll save the animals. Mm-hmm. We'll go to heaven, whatever it is. And I don't disagree with any of that. That's, that's great. But when it comes to maximizing health, if a person's overweight wants to lose weight, if a person has heart disease, diabetes, if they've got cancer, or if they're healthy and their goal is to live the maximum healthy life possible, I believe the evidence supports the idea of an exclusively whole plant food diet that's free of SOS. SOS is the international symbol of danger, and it stands for salt, oil, and sugar. Now, can you have a little salt and still be healthy? Yes, just like sometimes people can have a beer and not be a drunk. But for my patient population, which is either sick people that wanna get well, or the healthy people that really wanna maximize their health, a whole plant food SOS free diet, I believe will prove to be the most health promoting diet out there. Now, is it the best diet for society to add? No, I'm not arguing that. I'm so grateful that people like Dr. Campbell and Dr. Esselstein and Dr. McDougall are out there educating the world. I'm not that nice of a person. Mm-hmm. I'm only interested in my patient and the, and the maximizing the people that in, that's in front of me. And the people that I see are often sick or healthy and wanna stay that way. And so I believe that is the best advice for them. Now, does that mean somebody can't have a more flexible diet and still be healthy? No, of course they can. And if it's working for you, that's great. I'm not gonna argue with it. But if you're struggling, don't pretend that there's not another level of compliance that's possible. And I suggest people try it this way because they might find out, you know, they don't miss all that salty, sugary stuff anyway. Mm. And they may be just as happy. And if not, that's fine. If you can modify the diet, maintain the numbers, not screw up our outcome data. You know, <laughs> I'm not a policeman. I'm just trying yeah. to give you the best advice I can. But I, I do believe I'm right. Now, if it turns out I'm wrong and the evidence supports that you're better off having more than 1500 milligrams of sodium a day because that's an important reason for some reason, then I'll change my recommendation. Okay, I'm recommending what I'm recommending based on the combination of 36 years of clinical experience watching people get well and my ability to interpret the scientific literature and the, and the staff that we have at the True North Health Foundation that are doing the same. And so, up till now, a lot of the stuff that we used to advocate was criticized heavily. Mm-hmm. 
most of the stuff that we've been advocating, if you go back for 36 years, has been accepted as reasonable. The two things that we do that are still controversial is recommend a lower sodium intake than some of our colleagues. By, and this type of diet ends up having about a gram of sodium in it, naturally. And water-only fasting. Mm-hmm. And I believe in both cases, the data is gonna prove we're right. Mm. What do you say to the, the low-carb proponent who tells you, uh, listen, you know, we need some of these oils in our diet. You know, healthy olive oil has its place. We've seen that in the Mediterranean diet. We've had tremendous results with people losing weight and maintaining their weight and reversing a whole litany of conditions. So, you know, why not just go that route? Like what, when you have to measure those two protocols against each other, how do you think about Well, there's about a number that? of protocols you're actually covering there. Yeah. But like for example- But the, these things the, get conflated in this conversation that's the, going uh, on. The dead Dr. Atkins diet, the high protein, high fat diets, they'll argue, well, we got weight loss. I don't disagree. And a lot of times what's really good for short-term benefit isn't necessarily the same thing that's good for long-term outcome. Same thing in athletics. You can inject anabolic steroids and you can get some pretty powerful short-term effects, but then you get the testicular atrophy and you get Mm -hmm. cancer and die and it's not so good in the long run. So what's good for short-term weight loss isn't necessarily the same thing as what's good for long-term health support. And I don't disagree that a lot of these programs are effective for weight loss. Heck, you can cut the hip off at the leg and lose 40 pounds overnight. Now, it may not be, you know, a net benefit to you, but just because you you want instant weight loss, there's lots of things you can do. As far as the other alternatives, which is maybe a higher fat, low protein diet in, inducing a ketogenic state, that may very well have some short-term benefits. It may even have some long-term benefits. But when you compare the results that we see clinically in the conditions that we treat, um, there's nothing I've seen that's worked better than an exclusively whole plant food SOS free mm. diet. And I have the luxury of having patients living with me sometimes for a period of a year or more. So we're able to really test the diet and see what it takes for them to actually recover their health. That's one of the downsides of living with your patients because if they don't get well, who can you blame? Right, they've been with you for We've a year. Got wow, you have people stay with you for a whole year. Sometimes longer than a year. Wow. I've got people there now longer. Well, sometimes we've had people checked in that were being sent to the nursing home and we came as the alternative and then they get well and go home. Mm. And it was, you know, 2000 a month less staying with us right. than at the nursing home. So, you know, for those individuals, it was an economic benefit. Uh-huh. Um, other people come in because they're gonna do long-term fasting, long-term recovery. They've got serious health problems. Sometimes it takes us a couple months just to get people off all their drugs. Some people come in because they don't feel comfortable living freely mm-hmm. because they've got some issues with food and eating. They wanna live in a controlled setting until they really get it down. So they feel comfortable going out there. And the same thing true with alcoholics. Some people you say, quit drinking and they quit. Some people go to outpatient treatment, they do great. Some people do 30 day programs. Some people do 90 day programs. Some people, you know, have to do longer. Yeah. So you have to make it to meet the patient's need. So, so I'll tell you a funny thing. We have this phone coaching thing I told you about. And so one of our doctors, uh, Dr. Chilla Veras, does a lot of phone coaching with people. And so people would call up on me and we decide, okay, they need to come in and fast, but it's a couple months before we have an opening. So I say, why don't you work with Dr. Veras in the meantime? And when you come in, you won't have to be here so long. You'll, and then they go and get well. Uh-huh. And it's happening a lot. I'm giving her a hard time. I say, you got them well before we could come in. We, couldn't, we screwed up our, our study, uh-huh. our documentation. They're all well, you know, but it's okay. How many, how many beds do you have though? You probably are right capacity most of the time. Yeah, we have. Yeah. We can handle about 70 people. So we're, right. we're gonna run about two months or so out. You know, it was interesting after the COVID thing, we, all of our foreign people had to cancel. And uh-huh. that's 15% of our people. We had 50 people wow. that couldn't get in, but we had so many more local people because now people can work from home. Mm. So some people that wanted to come in, but they, you know, they couldn't afford to miss work during the they're full able, time. So they're working so they can while come, they're- Some people are able to come in, wow. do a fast, but then they can, during recovery, they uh-huh. can go back to working remotely because we have excellent Wi-Fi bandwidth and all right. that stuff. <laughs> so, you know, those patients are able to actually function, uh-huh. you know, in a controlled setting, but not necessarily yeah. miss work. Mm. Um, sometimes we have situations where they've got kids. Well, now we have like suites that people book family units. So they may come in to fast, but they can have their family wow. there. And so the family learns to eat good food and there's no cooking, you know. And so there's lots of different ways to adapt to people's needs, depending on what it is they're really wanting to accomplish. Our limiting factor is we have to have highly motivated people that really want to pay the price to get well. Yeah. And if if they do. That's the determining factor in success. I mean, it's so similar to the recovery community. I mean, you have outpatient you know, situations you have inpatient. I mean, I'm, I did inpatient for a hundred days, and uh, you know, now I think I should have stayed longer. Like it was, it was, it had such a dramatic. I mean, it saved my life, and it 
gave me a new life, but I needed that much time. And then, you know, a lot of people from that experience, and I work with people today who are in halfway houses or, you know, sober living facilities, there are all of these transitionary scenarios that are available to people to help them not just create these new habits and 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 you know build a new foundation for their life but you need that support system in place in order for it to really lock in so that they can carry it out in the world in a in a permanent way you know we have a because we're a 501c3 nonprofit research driven organization our price point is quite modest our price yeah. is the same as they were 12 years ago right. 149 that's why a chef night. aj goes to, she's like it's cheaper for me the, the to go to north than go to hotel well, we actually have businessmen <laughs> sometimes they'll yeah. choose to stay with us when they're on the road because they get their meals and they, it's cheaper Hilarious. than the Tree, you know what I mean? So you need to charge more. Well, no, the idea is, or you need more beds, or I don't know what we you want need. to keep the price point as low as possible. Well, uh -huh. There's a reason we haven't raised rates in the last 12 years, is because people need to stay long enough to get well. They right. need to be able to come back if they need support. And by keeping as low a rate as possible, it broadens the number of people uh -huh. that can actually afford to Does do insurance the insurance cover it? The insurance will cover their medical exam, the, all the traditional medical management things, not the part where you get well. Uh -huh. That of course wouldn't be part of health insurance. The daily rate at the center, the 149. But if to seeing the medical doctor getting any scan or lab, that would be treated just like it would any uh -huh. insurance. What is interesting though, people that have medical savings accounts, that covers the state at the center mm. fully because you are temporarily disabled. You are under direct medical supervision. You are being treated on an inpatient basis. It seems like with the explosion in the rates of obesity and diabetes and all of these you know, chronic lifestyle ailments that are debilitating millions of people every year and escalating at a shocking rate, that there would be clinics like this in every city available to people because it really is an opportunity for you to reboot and reframe your relationship to the habits and the foods that you're eating that are creating these problems in the first place. Otherwise, you just become a ward of the pharmaceutical industry. Well, I hope you're correct. I hope you're predicting just exactly what we're starting to see, new facilities opening. But you also have to remember, any place that makes you give up coffee, alcohol, uh -huh. tobacco, meat, fish, fowl, <laughs> eggs, dairy products, People oil, salt, sugar, yeah. and maybe it's consider fasting. Sell. I mean, you know, that's, that's a tough, yeah, yeah. you know. I have patients that their friends say, well, what do you go there to fast? Just come, you can come to my garage. I'll give you the hose. You don't want right. to charge anything. Yeah, <laughs> that is true. Although, you know, I think when people are looking at that quadruple bypass, you know, other, those options don't seem so onerous anymore. And I think the thing is, we've, we've arrived at this cultural moment where anything uncomfortable is seen as you know, optional in our lives, right? We're so disconnected from challenge and s stepping outside of our comfort zones. And to tell somebody, look, you've got to you know, overhaul everything that you're doing is a difficult message. It's a, it's a very undigestible message. But at the same time, like I know in my own experience, and look, you've done this with 20,000 people, to get those people through those uncomfortable weeks and have them arrive on the other side where you know you can pull the curtains open and the sun shines in and suddenly those foods they thought were unpalatable actually taste good their cravings have changed they actually look forward to their meals with these you know plant foods i mean that's a miraculous thing that i just wish more people could discover in their lives yeah, it's, uh, it is a miraculous thing. Uh, and I think for the specific, highly motivated, self-selected people that we treat, mm. uh, we have a really high satisfaction ratio and we're still yeah. here, which is kind yeah. of a miracle in itself, just the idea and that- it, you know, And then you do have a really high rate of people that maintain these, these practices. You know, we're, right? we're interested- How we're closely doing, do you ta tabs do you keep on people? We're doing uh, a uh, adherence study starting in January of next year, mm. which is designed to do long-term tracking of it very carefully in terms of, uh, patient actual dietary compliance. It's actually difficult research to do in terms of monitoring specifically what people are consuming mm -hmm. and not consuming. But we've actually designed a study that's gonna let us do some really long-term tracking of people. Because what we're trying to find out is how strict do you have to be to get the best 
ratio of return. Do you have to be as strict as we say, Hmm. or could you be more flexible? Like many of our colleagues recommend programs. Right. Problem we have with them is their recidivism rates. Their theory is that by being more flexible with the diet, you'll get more people in. Our theory is by being strict with the diet, you can keep more people in. Mm -hmm. But I can't prove that yet because that data hasn't been done. Mm. We did just recently though, do a retrospective analysis of 1,100 people that had been to the center and that had experienced 10% or more of weight loss, looking at what people had sustained that magnitude of weight loss over a period of a year, and it was over 30%. Hmm. And so, although that means a lot of people didn't maintain the full magnitude of weight loss, that doesn't mean that they haven't improved their overall health, but just the fact that people can do that and sustain that, and as much as a third of those people apparently are able to, that's to me very encouraging, because under a conventional treatment, weight loss is around 93 to 97% failure rate. No matter what, wow. gastric bypass, mm-hmm. when you look at who sustains long-term weight loss, what kind of health benefits, very poor. It's so poor that most physicians say, ah, it's not even worth worrying about, just let them be fat, forget about it. Right. Um, what is the study that you'd like to see done, whether with respect to fasting or, or eating a whole plant food diet? Like what, what, where's the gap right now? Well, you- the, the real gap is looking at what effect on healthy people does healthy living have and what effect on healthy people does periodic fasting have in terms of preventing them from ultimately getting debility. And that's why we're doing what we call this navigator study, where we're uh-huh. gonna enroll a large number of people and track them the rest of their life. And so the goal is to be able to demonstrate. Now it'll take us a while, you know, until they reach that yeah. that point. Uh, and it's particularly a problem because once people adopt this diet and lifestyle habits, they tend to live a lot longer. My mother, when she turned 92 years old, she used to get all kinds of trouble from her friends because her son's crazy diet that she's following. Uh-huh. But at 92, she realized she had outlived all 52 of her lifelong friends. They were all dead. And she said she realized here she was, 92 years old. Everybody was gone. And she said, Alan, you need to warn your patients. If they're gonna eat this kind of diet, make younger friends, Mm. much younger. Because she said, even the people 10 years younger didn't wanna play bridge and do stuff. They were too busy suffering with their consequences. So the bottom line is that it's likely that if you avoid the causes of premature death, you know, you're still gonna die. You're gonna reach your genetic potential someday, but the period of debility may be dramatically reduced. So you have to be prepared to live a fully functional life up until you reach your genetic potential and not count on vegetating in some nursing home waiting for people to change your diaper for the last 10 years of your life. I like that you got your mom on board. Well, my mom and my father, my father actually, when he, when I just started practice was having transient ischemic attacks, had, had to retire from teaching because of cognitive decline. And he um, was really suffering. He came in and was probably one of my most diligent patients, mm. did the fasting, recovered his health. And 20 years later, he helped edit the pleasure trap. Oh, wow. So, you know, he That's was, cool he was really good to see. Uh, both my, my mother and father, uh, you know, got it started later in life because uh-huh. you know, I didn't know, you know, er- yeah, yeah. early enough, but... Uh, and both ended up doing uh, uh, doing really well, so wow. that was good. And good lives and good deaths, deaths in close proximity to the end of their life, where they that's didn't what go it's through. about. Yeah, I think it's an important issue. Yeah. And it's oftentimes not really addressed that how valuable it is to spend the last eight years of your life, however long that's going to be, fully functional, capable yeah. of taking care of yourself. And what percentage of healthcare do we expend on treating people where we don't affect their all-cause mortality? And we may not even be improving the quality of their life, but we're basically just fostering the consequences of poor dietary choices. And oftentimes because people don't even realize that what they're doing is killing themselves mm. with their fork and knife. Yeah, and warehousing them through those later years where they're so uh, debilitated that the quality of life is de minimis at that point. So we talk a lot about longevity, how, how, how many years are you gonna live, but it's really about the quality of those years. Yeah, healthy life expectancy to me is even more important than life expectancy. Mm-hmm. And interesting, life expectancy for the first time is actually starting to drop. Healthy life expectancy, the number of years you spend fully functional, that should be, I believe, the target. Mm. And that's what I believe that where fasting can have the greatest good is in healthy people that use it preventatively to stay healthy in conjunction with a diet, sleep, and exercise regime that's health promoting. Are there other cultures overseas where fasting is more a part of the kind of mainstream 
Well, if you look in Germany, lifestyle. modified fasting at least, the Buchling Tire Clinic and others are covered by the system. And I think there's a little bit more acceptance of it. Water only fasting is still pretty extreme. Yeah. And I think it's up to us to actually demonstrate that what we're doing is not only safe, which we've done, but is effective. Right. And, and I can't say that that's been done. There's not enough research done. But that's why the True North Health Foundation is excited. We have a laboratory now, we have an affiliated IRB, so human subjects committee can be re- approved by people that actually know stuff about um, fasting. In fact, Dr. Clapper is one of the Uh uh, uh, professional members of the IRB. And um, we have a research team, Dr. Myers, our director of research, and others that we've now hired to be able to actually conduct these trials. We've got these affiliations with researchers around the world. Some of these big impact researchers Mm. like Walter Longo. So hopefully we'll be able to do some meaningful research in the next couple of years. We have a great human subjects laboratory at the Truman Health Center. We admit a thousand people a year for fasting already. We already have all the mechanisms in place to conduct the trial, to collect the data. You know, it's happening. And so for me, it's 36 years waiting to get to this point to where we can actually start doing meaningful prospective studies. We're there now and we're ready to do it. And the proceeds from the True North Health Center fund the True North Health Foundation. Mm. And so we're not dependent on exogenous grants in order to be, thank goodness, in order to be able to fund our research because we can do it internally. Uh, and, And that's perhaps one of our greatest successes is really pulling that off. That's why you don't see, I don't think a lot of clinical research being done by other than university based facilities with all of their politics. We're really a freestanding independent research facility that isn't dependent or beholden to anybody. And you need to educate the next generation of medical practitioners, which is exactly what Dr. Clapper, treasure to humanity is doing in this like third act of his career, going yes. around and lecturing to young medical students. Absolutely. it's cool. And that's what our internship and residency training is all about. Yeah. So you only have 70 some odd beds, right? Not everybody can go to True North. So what is the recommendation? Like, how do you talk to the person who's listening to this or watching this, who's looking to make some lifestyle changes, but isn't ready to, you know, get in their car and drive up to Northern California and well, stay with you for 40 the days. The True North phone coaching service is really yeah. great. They can go into our website and get access to mm-hmm. a doctor right where they sit. For under a hundred dollars, they can do a phone consultation where all of their records have been reviewed and work with a doctor in uh-huh. detail on an ongoing basis. They can talk to me for free. They can call and I'll help at least point them in the right direction, send them to a place that's closest to them, hook them up with the appropriate doctor, whatever it is they need to do. Or they can read the books now. Get Dr. Campbell's whole book and read it or China's study. Look at Dr. Um, McDougall's excellent books. Mm -hmm. Starch Solution. Starch Solution is fabulous. Um, Dr. Esselstyn's book. Wonderful. I mean, the, we've got so many great resources now from people that are out there doing a really good job representing the scientific literature accurately, in it, but in a way that people can understand and they're meaningful and useful. Our website, everything we do is freely available on our website at truenorthhealth.com. So they can go on there. There's video. In fact, we're just about to launch our own Roku channel mm. where all of our content is going to be available, oh, including wow. our lecture program, our live lecture program at the center. So people have access to that kind of education and support. Obviously, uh, you know, nobody should do a water only fast uh, without medical supervision. But if somebody does want to start experimenting with some intermittent fasting or some things that they could do at home. Like how do you, what's the kind of advice that you give to that person? The first advice, it's really important that history exam and lab be looked at just because the medications particularly can really be complicated. Even with intermittent fasting, unless you take care of the medication complications, you, you know, you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble. So whoever's prescribing that medication uh-huh. at least needs to be discussed with, a lot of times they don't know anything about diet. They don't even know how to get people off drugs. And so that's why I would suggest find a local uh, plant-based doctor or use one of our phone coaches to at least make sure, am I a good candidate for this? And then they can tell you, look, you'd be a good candidate. You might wanna do Walter Longo's program or you might wanna right. do, here's something you can do on your own. These are things that are reasonable. The problem is people are so screwed up from long-term dietary abuse and medication complications that even simple things like, well, just eat a good diet. Yes, that's great. Anybody can do that, but you still may need to keep into account that you might have to modify the the pharmaceutical preparations that you've been given inappropriately. Mm -hmm. And what about um, people that are are moving in the direction of of eating a more whole plant-based diet? What are some of the sort of psychological tools that they can rely on that would be helpful in making them uh, successful in that switch? Well, one thing I'd say is keep it to yourself. 
don't become, you know, a born again hygienist where you're trying to shove down your beliefs and other mm -hmm. people's it, because it doesn't work very well. You're just going to antagonize everybody around you and make a lot of stress. So you can set a good example, but my advice is only answer questions that are asked directly. Don't be going around and and trying to shove your belief systems in everybody else's but face. But support is also important, right? Having some accountability to somebody seems to be effective. Yeah, and that's why I always encourage people to, to take advantage of, you know, the, around the country now, there are doctors that aren't complete idiots that are trying to encourage and advocate support the plant-based uh, physicians, mm -hmm. et cetera. So there are resources available. That's one of the reasons I'm excited about this phone coaching business because we can expand that. Uh, broad, you know, all across the world. This is, you know, automated systems are highly efficient. And we're adding more doctors to the list as the demand increases so that there will be people and resources available to people that are serious about making these diet and lifestyle changes. Right. Honestly, for relatively healthy people, all they got to do is start eating a whole plant food diet and stop mm. the rest of it. For those of the, you that struggle making those changes, those are, then you have to find the appropriate support that you need. And if you can have even one friend that they don't even have to do it, they could just be tolerate you doing it, that does make a difference. Yeah. So right now you, I'm sure know the statistics better than I do, but something like 70% of Americans are obese or overweight, childhood obesity rates are through the roof. Type two diabetes. Epidemic is what 30% of Americans well, whatever right it now? is it's going to be more tomorrow right these these things are escalating astronomically and this really is you know covid pandemic aside like this is that this is a, a you know a health pandemic epidemic of a different nature that um needs to be addressed in new and different ways. What we're doing right now certainly is not working. And the path forward and what you have so beautifully demonstrated through a lifetime of work is to show that agency plays a huge part here and that we can take better control of our health by making some pretty basic, simple lifestyle changes that are rooted in evidence-based medicine and science that are proven to work. I mean, 20,000 patients over the years, the, a level of success that you've experienced, the long-term success of these patients speaks for itself and it's powerful, man. And so uh, for somebody who's listening or watching, who feels stuck, who feels like they can't make that change, who is mired in the vicious cycle of the pleasure trap, to be able to give people a lifeline and say, it doesn't have to be this way, that there is hope and there is a way out, I think is, you know, that's God's work that you're doing. Yeah, we're having fun. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, it's interesting, the, uh, the uh, feedback from The Pleasure Trap has been interesting because that book came out uh, more than yeah, a decade a long ago. Time. Yeah, it's been out a yeah. long time. But actually the sales of The Pleasure Trap now are actually Increase it. Mm. So it's take that message is a message maybe been a little bit of ahead of its time, but now it seems like it's resonating yeah. with, a, with a broader audience. And that, uh, that's been really interesting to see. We have a new book that we're working on right now on fasting that'll be out or be done by the oh, end cool. of the year. So with we're Doug? excited about that. Okay, Actually, Dr. Or... Lyle is finally coming towards the end of his book that he's been working mm. on for uh, oh, a number in, of years. Is he in Hawaii right now? He's on a, on he's a writing, right he's, yeah, he's on a writing <laughs> sequestration in Hawaii right uh -huh. now, and he's not to come home until he finishes the yeah. book. So yeah. I had Dr. Gregor in here the other day, and I think there, he is now out there. With, they're all out there writing books together. Yeah. So well, I'm really excited. I've heard uh -huh. 20 of the chapters off Dr. Last's book, and it's wow. brilliant. And it's I'm really excited to, uh -huh. to have him put that out there, because I think that's going to be a whole nother you know, message and another angle that's gonna be really necessary and very useful. Cool. Um, final question that I ask all of my medical professional guests. If you were suddenly in the position of being the Surgeon General in charge of making policy decisions and regulatory decisions about health in America, where do you start? Well, what I would say right now, the most important thing is uh, recognizing that we need to make our people less vulnerable to the various diseases, whether it's chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes or the acute diseases like COVID-19, we need to make them less vulnerable. So we have to start educating people up that health results from healthful living. So we need to fight to 
improve the diet and lifestyle habits of people because honestly, you're not gonna completely avoid exposure to every infectious mm -hmm. agent that comes along and we're not gonna be able to escape heart disease, cancer, and diabetes unless we adopt healthful habits. So we should be incentivizing, encouraging, intimidating, whatever it takes people to adopt a health-promoting diet and lifestyle. My opinion is that is close to a whole plant food SOS-free diet with regular sleep and prioritized, uh, uh, regular exercise and prioritized sleep as you can get, that that's what's gonna result in healthy living. Diet, sleep, exercise. You do that, you'll do more than all the other uh, job boning that's taking place right now. Mm. Powerful Dr. Goldhammer, thank you. It's my pleasure, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course, I appreciate it. Thank you uh, for sharing your powerful testimony today. Um, if you wanna learn more about Dr. Goldhammer and his works, pick up the Pleasure Trap book that he co-wrote with Doug Lyle. Um, and where is the best place to direct people online to learn more about what you're doing? Well, if you go to www.truenorthhealth.com, mm -hmm. you'll get access to everything you need. If you wanna learn specifically about fasting, there's a website called fasting.org, which is a fasting compendium website. Mm. Cool, and I'll link all that up in the show notes and your phone's gonna start ringing. All right, come back and talk to me again. Mm -hmm.